But welcome and good afternoon to all. Good morning for those connecting from the, the west and good evening for those connecting from the east. Welcome to this plenary side event on forest and land monitoring for climate action for and by indigenous peoples and local communities. My name is John Fernandez de la Reynoa. I lead the FAO Indigenous Peoples Unit and I have the pleasure and honor to facilitate this session today. In any indigenous peoples event, we start normally with a spiritual ceremony. Um, in this case, I would like to acknowledge and to send a remembrance of the Todas from Bikapatimund Bika in the Nilgiris in Tamil Nadu that wanted to be with us, but they couldn't make it. So we send our regards to them. Now, why are forest and land monitoring for climate action so important for indigenous peoples and local communities? Let me provide a few examples from the point of view of indigenous peoples. In 2021, FAO published a technical report on forest governance by indigenous peoples in Latin America and the Caribbean, highlighting opportunities for climate actions. The report brought to the light the urgency to protect forest territories of indigenous peoples, given their great contribution to climate mitigation and adaptation. For indigenous peoples, their territories, lands, and natural resources are sacred. Research carried out by FAO and the Alliance of Biodiversity International and SEAT in 2021 saw how indigenous peoples can source up, up to 80% of their food from their territories. In a nutshell, for indigenous peoples, if there is no access to land and territories, there is no food security. This was already enshrined in the Right to Food Guidelines approved in, by FAO members in, 20, in 2004. And this is actually three years ahead of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples endorsed in the General Assembly. In 2017, the high-level panel of experts of the Committee on World Food Security published a report on sustainable forestry for food security and nutrition. As per this report, 200 million indigenous persons in the world depend primarily on natural forests for their livelihoods, such as hunting, gathering, and sifting cultivation. This represents more than 40% of the 476 million indigenous peoples that make up the world population of indigenous peoples. The indigenous hunter-gatherers are those among indigenous peoples that often are most vulnerable. They go marginalized and very often they are discriminated. Their rights are particularly ignored and violated and their livelihoods depend very much so on the forest that they inhabit. At the same time, we need to advance together on the global need to recognize and protect indigenous peoples' rights to their forests, territories, and lands. The voluntary guidelines on land tenure adopted in, 20, in, in 2012 by the FAO members reaffirm the critical link again between tenure and food security already highlighted in the, food, uh, in the right to food guidelines. So indigenous peoples are the guardians of the largest third of the remaining world's biodiversity. And this is the biodiversity that we haven't exterminated with other forms of territorial management in the planet. Indigenous peoples through their food and knowledge systems are capable of adapting to their food generation and production to the ecosystems where they live. Their food systems are rooted in their forests, tundra, icelands, and other ecosystems. So these indigenous peoples' food and knowledge systems protect biodiversity and manage territories and ecosystems in a sustainable way, and they have done so for thousands of years. Yet, their indigenous peoples' rights continue to be violated worldwide. Indigenous peoples are still being displaced today. I just came back from the UN Permanent Forum, where we met an elder that he was telling us that in his lifetime he has been displaced five times from his home. Five times he has been displaced. And he only had one message for countries, UN agencies, NGOs. He said, I wish that my children will not be displaced a single time in their lifetime. And I know that I'm going to die and I will never have a home because I just keep being displaced from one area to the next. We need to rethink and do things differently. We want to achieve the SDGs. During the COP26 at Glasgow, indigenous peoples and local communities promised to receive 1.7 billion to support the advancement of their forest tenure rights, as well as the greater recognition of their roles as guardians of forest and nature. Target three 
of the coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework negotiated at the COP15 on the Convention on Biological Diversity this last December ask for the recognition and respect of the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities in the context of the upcoming conservation of at least 30% of the planet's lands and oceans. Indigenous territories, indigenous peoples' territories should be part of this 30% and should be recognized. Today we have an opportunity with eminent panelists to advance in these discussions and ensure that in the context of forest, the different tools, the different projects, the different programs put an end to the violation of indigenous people's rights and the displacement that very often well-intended policies are causing. Let me pass the floor straight away to Jenny Lopez from the UK. And Jenny Lopez is a land governance advisor in the Food, Land and Agriculture team at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Jennifer is going to be talking virtually with us. The floor is yours, Jenny. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. Just checking you can hear me. You could. Fantastic. Um, really appreciate the offer to speak with you today and thank you for the brilliant introduction. You've actually said so much already of, of what I was hoping to say. So thank you for capturing and framing that so well. Um, so I'm a land governance advisor at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and we've been leading a lot of the initial work for the Forest um, Tenure Pledge which was launched at COP26 um, and working very much in collaboration with other donors and stakeholders, um, civil society organisations and Indigenous people and local community groups themselves which really um, made that moment happen. So as, as has already been captured today, you know, just some brief recap of why this is so critical. We have today at least 1.6 billion people who are living near the forests, who depend on those forest resources for their livelihoods, um, for their food, for their income, also their, very much their homes. But an estimated 36% of the world's remaining intact forests are within indigenous people's lands. However, less than 10% of that is legally recognised. Of the 50% of land that sits within at least that it, it is um, owned, managed by IPLCs, and I'm saying IPLC as an abbreviation today for Indigenous peoples and local communities, um, less than 10% of that is legally recognised. We know that IP and LCs are the most effective and resilient stewards of biodiversity and ecosystem services. We have a lot of evidence, a lot of studies that really demonstrate that these communities, these forest communities, are the most effective guardians of forest and nature. However, they don't have those legal ownership. They don't have those rights. But most importantly, and perhaps critically from the perspective of the pledge, they're not getting the support from donors, from governments, um, from broader society to be able to, to maintain that their livelihoods there, maintain their role of forests and stewards um, and nature. So it's a very good study by Rainforest Foundation Norway, which demonstrates that of all the overseas development aid of ODA funding, less than 1%, only a fraction is going to supporting um, forest tenure and land management um, programs and projects. And even of that 1%, even less of that is actually reaching um, indigenous peoples and local community organizations themselves. So we're seeing a really, really small fraction of, of global funding and support is really understood and being channeled in the right way to reach communities. So at COP26, um, the, the UK in collaboration with other donors launched this pledge. It was a really historic moment for um, $1.7 billion to if to be um, to go towards and to be channeled towards projects on forest tenure. It was also a historic moment because it was the first time we had um, leaders, representatives from indigenous people and community organisations on stage alongside government. And the same happened again last year. So we at COP. So we hope that will be a precedent now to really recognise the importance of um, bringing together leadership from indigenous communities and government on the stage and, and, and working together in this way, achieving the visibility and the momentum that is needed. It's also just to mention that the 
pledge is linked to the Global Forest Finance Pledge and the Glasgow Leaders Declaration. So it is also being recognised that, that if connecting the different pledges that are in place and recognising the importance of forest tenure alongside the other commitments and much bigger commitments made from governments, not just donors, but broader governments on the importance of this if we're going to tackle climate change, biodiversity, other ecosystem services issues, we need to join those dots. So the pledge itself, this really recognised the importance of um, Indigenous people and local communities. It's a commitment not just to mobilise financial support, that 1.7, but also recognise that more effective donor support, more effective funding channels are needed, but also more effective partnerships with Indigenous people and local communities, with civil society organisations and between donors, between donors themselves. So this, what we have promised to do as donors is to have more effective coordination, is to uh, look, look at the way we're funding projects and programmes. We're not saying it's only direct support that's needed. We need funding at different levels from local to regional to more systemic work on policies, um, on, on tenure reforms. But we need to be making sure that's happening more effectively. One year on from that pledge, we, we published a report last year at COP27, I'd encourage you all to read it. Um, we're making some progress. We now have 7% of funding reaching IPLCs, so that's some improvement on the initial 1%, but it's of course still not enough. There's still so much work to do. There are still many challenges, and I think we all know there's many challenges with direct funding themselves. So there's many administrative burdens, there's many, um, there's many problems with how those um, we, we, let's say the capacity of Indigenous people and local community organisations to absorb funding. It's, it's, there's a lot of issues that we need to tackle in how we can find more effective routes. Um, and we need more types of programmes and projects that are exploring that, that are looking at how we can channel funds more effectively through different types of intermediary organisations, through different ways of working. Um, and this really is that commitment from donors is to start to find new ways of funding, new ways of working in partnership with organisations. And this is where we come to a new programme that we're really excited to support um, as, as the UK, and that is called aim for forest so it's a new um it's a new project we're taking forward it's 24.5 um, million um, pounds and it's part of our uk international climate finance investment it will be delivered by um fao it's going to be running to 2028 and it will be working with 20 countries across africa asia pacific and latin america um, the point of this programme is to support capacity building efforts for um, Indigenous people and local communities. So that's including to modest forest areas towards enabling participation in emerging carbon standards. The aim is to further strengthen the um, the role of IPLCs as forest stewards and better support their integration and how we can unlock new ways of getting funding to those communities. I think what's really important and for us exciting about the way um, that Aim for Forest has been designed, and I know you're going to hear more about this next today, so I'll leave all the detail, um, but the what's exciting for us is it's not just about a, a program which is for IPLCs, but the purpose of it is very much to be designed in partnership with Indigenous peoples and local communities. It's to genuinely ensure that it's meeting their needs, um, it's meeting their demands, it's really trying to evaluate um, how you can ensure that it's being more effective in the way that funding is spent. Um, and as the UK, I think that's what we really want to do is, is understand how we can learn from projects like this, how we can share um, projects like this with other donors um, to see how we can scale this up. This is just the start of, of many of many other new ways of working, we hope, and we're really excited to, to learn more, to share more, and to keep that dialogue open um, with, with 
yourselves, stakeholders that are here today, and other donors to really see how we can scale that up over the years ahead. Um, thank you very much. I'll pass on now um, back to my colleagues who, who are on the panel and there with you today. Thank you very much thank for this you. opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. And uh, please stay with us. I, I, it is very important, very powerful opening about uh, the, the importance of uh, increasing the funding that goes to indigenous peoples directly. I remember in COP, uh, we, we met, we discussed about uh, that 7% of the actual disbursement that is going to uh, for indigenous peoples, and indigenous peoples were concerned, were disheartened, and concerned about the, the number of intermediary organizations that were, uh, in a way, getting the funding and not indigenous people. So uh, point taken out, the need to scale that. And uh, please stay with us in the questions and answers so that we can have a brainstorming. and. Uh, Perhaps the Coalition on Indigenous Peoples also offers an opportunity to help scale up those very important initiatives that you're leading. But thank you so much for those opening words. I'm going to pass straight away to Ward Anseu. Dr. Ward Anseu is a development economist, a policy analyst, and a research fellow at the CIRAT. He's right now seconded to the International Land Coalition as the lead technical specialist responsible for the Global Land Observatory and uh, as the chair of the Landmark. A word. Thank you so much for being with us. The floor is yours. Thanks, Jan, um, and good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, those uh, in the West. Um, I think what I heard from and what I saw from the other presentations uh, that this panel and this project that we will present, that we are presenting now to you, Aim for Forest, and in particular its work package three on Indigenous peoples and local communities, is a bit uh, the black duck in the conference and in, in, in the sector. Um, first of all, because we put on purpose indigenous peoples and local communities to the fore. We're not seeing only the trees and no, not only seeing the forest, but what is happening in these forests and who is taking the decisions in these forests and who has the rights in these forests. And secondly, because on top of forest, we also put lands to the fore. So this work package three of the aims for forest will not only monitor forest, but also lands, because we think they are absolutely intertwined and not doing them together would be, would be a mistake. And let me, let me justify that with some data. And I recognize I will, I will repeat some of the data Jenny and, and Jon have, have nicely presented, but I think it is important to re-emphasize that and uh, yeah, to, to show you the legitimacy of, of, this, uh, of this project and of the need of combining sectors beyond, beyond forests. So why indigenous peoples and local communities? Well, we've said it already, 70% of the world's forests are on government administrated land. But what has not been said yet is that most of these lands, most of these forests are claimed by indigenous peoples and local communities and only 15% of them are recognized and documented. So there's a huge gap there. So IPLCs are de facto the owners and the decision makers of these lands and of most of the forests on the planet. So why do we talk mainly and only in, 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 uh, in some of these forests to governments? Indigenous peoples and local communities should be part and parcel of these discussions from the beginning, from shaping them, planning them, and executing them. As Jenny said, awareness has been created around the indigenous peoples and local communities, but we are far from the reality to include them. 7% only trickles down to where the support is needed. Now, why land? Why forest and land? Well, 50% of the world's land is owned and occupied by indigenous peoples and local communities. Most of them are those where the forests lie. Only 10% are recognized and documented. The same gap occurs here. So actually, when we speak about forests, when we speak about these trees, we do not know who owns these trees and who takes the decision on these trees. So there's an absolute need here so to map them. Not only these forests, as we've been hearing about in this, in this co conference, but also the rights and the rights bearers of these forests. And this can only start by mapping the territories, the lands, and the rights to these lands uh, where these forests are located. 
And that's precisely what Aims for Forest, and in particular its work package three on indigenous peoples and local communities, is aiming to. It is combining forests and, and, um, and land in a capacity um, transfer program, capacity building program. So to do so, we've established a partnership between FAO, the International Land Coalition, and particularly in a project called Landmark, in which the ILC is part of, and which is mapping the lands, resources, and the rights of indigenous peoples and correlating them to the forest monitoring that you all, aims for forest, and you all here are engaged in. <clears throat> so Landmark is a partnership of technical people, civil society organizations, and indigenous peoples and local communities, with IPLCs representing 50% of the steering committee guiding the work and making sure that we do respond to the needs of indigenous peoples and local communities and the realities that affect them on the ground. So how will we do this? Just a bit of detail on work package three of Aims for Forest. We will have four core activities, and this is still to be worked out now that it's been launched, it was launched yesterday, but these will be the four broad lines of work we will engage in. First of all, is mapping capacities and mapping needs together in partnership with indigenous peoples and local communities so that we really grab and understand what the needs out there are so that we can shape the learning packages, the capacity uh, building packages in this program adapted to the needs and adapted to the indigenous peoples and local communities contacts with them. Secondly, it's about empowering indigenous peoples and local communities by deploying these learning packages <clears throat> and these learning materials and these tools, of which we've heard a lot here, but adapting them to the realities of indigenous peoples, adapting them so that the indigenous peoples and local communities can use them on their own autonomously and <clears throat> through that um, build their own databases, strengthen their own decision-making processes, etc. To do so, we'll have various pathways um, tapping into what others have been doing already, like ILC, peer-to-peer -peer learning routes, um, broad-based capacity building clinics and webinars, etc. that exist out there, but really focus on this topic of land mapping, forest monitoring, and reaching directly through these channels, indigenous peoples and local communities. We will do so at various levels, hopefully reaching as many indigenous peoples and local communities as possible. The webinars, for example, we've all learned since COVID how to deal with it, allow us to reach, let's hope, all levels of indigenous peoples and local communities in a broad way. But we'll also dig deeper in the about 20 countries aim for forest is and will, will be working and focusing on, um, dig deeper and do more localized, hands-on, field, on the field trainings as well. Thirdly, use all the data that is being produced by Aims for, for Forests and the tools and, 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 and platforms linked to it, and the tools and platforms and data structures here at the GFOI to do research, putting to the fore indigenous peoples and local communities, especially to make the case for indigenous pe peoples and local communities. They are being put to the fore, and some stats, some data is coming out, but there's still a lot to be done to ground these activities, to have good practices coming out so that we can better learn and better accompany those, those activities on the ground, strengthening indigenous peoples and local communities. And then fourthly, and that's the most important part, I think, it is support for the establishment of indigenous peoples and local community-led communities of practice, where the indigenous peoples and local communities will manage themselves, the tools, the platforms, um, in a way they, want, they see relevant, managed by themselves in an autonomous way, so that they can use that for their decision-making processes, for their management on the ground. This we will deploy first at the regional level by establishing three or four, not sure yet, regional platforms, community of, of practices, um, together with them, but with the tools and the infrastructure, all open source, that can then be used by the indigenous peoples and local communities themselves at decentralized level, whether that's national or local, so that they can use it for their own 
processes of data building and decision making there where it's needed. Thank you very much. We are available here. If there's more information needed, Ames for Forest is here. The team of the Work Package 3 is here as well. We're pleased to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ward. And uh, I want to highlight those last words that you mentioned, <coughs> the, the importance that between linking data building with decision making and to advance together on the communities of practice. I'm going to pass the floor to Guy Makuluka Mukumo, Technical Officer at PIDP, a representative of Programme Intérêt pour le Développement du Peuple Pyrmé, and is one of the lead organizations of REPALEAC, the Réseau de Peuple Autochtone et Communauté Locale pour la Gestion Durable des Écosystèmes Forestiers de l'Afrique, dans le Congo Basin. Um, Guy, I would like to ask you about what are the challenges in your uh, community. On voudrait savoir ce qu'ils sont les défis dans votre pays, dans votre forêt, dans votre communauté. There is interpretation uh, in French available, uh, et so please, uh, the floor is yours, s'il vous plaît. A vous la parole. Ok, merci beaucoup. Uh, avant de tout commencer, Je tiens à remercier d'abord les organisateurs. Et après ça, j'ai une préoccupation. Je voudrais savoir si dans la salle, il y a d'autres peuples autochtones venus de différents continents. Il peut se lever, on puisse se voir et on continue. Il n'y en a pas. Voilà, c'est là où je vais commencer le défi. Donc, c'est ça le débit des défis que nous constatons, nous attaquons le peuple autochtone. Mon programme, est, nous, je travaille sur le programme intégré de développement du peuple pygmé au Kivu, Chiri Kalabambout, PIDEP en sigle. C'est. Ok, sur le plan de présentation, je pense qu'on peut passer, on descend directement sur euh, le slide suivant. Voilà, l'accès aux terres ancestrales, la sécurité de la tenue foncière sont des enjeux fondamentaux pour le peuple autochtone pygmé. Ces derniers entretiennent des liens étroits avec les forêts et les terres. Et ils adoptent pour leur bien et leur identité et leur survie. On passe. Parmi les contextes actuels, euh, il y a... Aspiration économique émergente, accès sur l'exploitation des ressources naturelles. Le droit coutumier des peuples autochtones et pygmées sur leurs terres et traditionnelles ne sont pas assurés. Des possessions à cause des activités de conservation, de la foresterie et de d'autres initiatives relatives aux ressources naturelles. La communauté autochtone et pygmée plus vulnérable et plus pauvre. On passe ça. Sur euh, la suite de la contexte actuel, il y a la réforme foncière par le gouvernement congolais qui saute en cours. Euh, et cela est en train d'être initié par les organisations qui accompagnent le peuple autochtone et pygmées. Euh, mais aussi, il y a euh, tant de défis euh, qui découlent sur ce sujet-là. Voilà euh, les défis qu'on peut citer que, qui est actuellement... Euh, sur les conditions de vie des peuples autochtones pygmées dans la République démocratique du Congo. Il y a les conflits fonciers de nature diverse, il y a la présence de sociétés minières dans des forêts ancestrales des communautés locales et peuples autochtones. Il y a aussi octroi des titres miniers sous couvert par les autorités gouvernementales. Il y a la superposition des titres dans des forêts des autochtones, manque de formation des matériels appropriés pour les cartographies locaux. Il y a un déficit de capacités techniques et opérationnelles de l'administration foncière. Il y a aussi l'absence de matériel de nouvelle génération pour observer les niveaux d'exploitation des terres provinciales au niveau provincial et local. Il y a aussi manque de moyens d'organisation. Voilà, parmi les stratégies qu'on a développées, euh, nous, en tant que programme intégré de développement du peuple pygmé au Kivu, il y a renforcement des capacités des acteurs clés. Il y a aussi planification participative de l'occupation des sols et des pratiques dans les zones rurales, dans une perspective disciplinaire. 
Il y a aussi des partenariats greffés sur les conventions et stratégies sectorielles pertinentes. Il y a aussi la communication et sensibilisation et les plaidoyers international et national. Ça, c'est pour les, les, les défis. Maintenant, les ententes pour cette activité euh, d'être ici aujourd'hui, nous avons entendu euh, plusieurs programmes le renforcement des capacités sur les outils de monitoring forestier et ressources naturelles et cartographie. Il y a aussi appui à la documentation. Il y a aussi euh, appui euh, au discours de la mise en œuvre à la foresterie communautaire comme principal outil pour faire des écosystèmes forestiers un véritable levier de développement. Il y a aussi formation pour naviguer les cadres globaux autour des climats. Il y a aussi besoin d'accès à l'information, tiré parti d'initiatives existantes de richesses d'informations et de données qui sont reconnues au niveau global. Et il y a aussi le réseautage, faire le membre des grandes organisations qui traitent sur les dossiers fonciers. On passe. Voilà euh, un peu sur le, le, le mot que je voulais de présenter. En un mot, euh, notre besoin et souhait, c'est faire une restauration des paysages forestiers. C'est la mission de tous pour un monde meilleur. Euh, S'il y a cas d'autres choses, en tant que des défis, on pourrait partager après, euh, même dans les couloirs. J'ai dit et je vous remercie. Merci, Guy, pour cette, euh, pour cette parole. Et je vais souligner et, un des trois points, et, et surtout sur les besoins que vous avez bien identifiés, non? parce qu'il y, y a plusieurs qui peuvent être à couvrir dans les, dans les projets qui sont sur les tables maintenant. Non? La superposition des titres, euh, la, la manque de cartographies locaux, l'absence de matériel de nouvelle génération, mais surtout, comme vous avez souligné, euh, l'avenir, la, en, en train de visuer sur euh, les capacités, la planification, le plaidoyer, mais aussi l'appui, le besoin d'appui à la foresterie communautaire et aussi à la sexe, à la formation. Merci beaucoup. I'm, I'm very happy that you ask uh, who are indigenous peoples in the room. I think if you have asked how many people will survive if they are put in the middle of a forest, the result would have been very similar. No? And most of us will not have survived because we don't have the, the knowledge about the forest around the world. I want to pass the floor to Khalid. Khalid, I'm very happy to be with you again in a panel. Um, Khalid Kawadlde is the director of DANA uh, and Kawadizia Local Community Cooperative in Jordan. And he is a representative of the World Alliance of Pastoralist Communities and Mobile Indigenous Peoples. Khalid, tell us a little bit what are the challenges that you have in Jordan and in the Near East uh, with relation to forest uh, indigenous peoples. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers, thank the landmark, thank um, the audience here to uh, attend this um, session. Um, I'm coming from Jordan, from a small village or little village in, in, in Jordan. Um, I can think, because I've been to many conferences as part of the, uh, my work with our membership with the World Alliance Mobile Indigenous Peoples, with the International Land Coalition and Habitat International Coalition and many other networks. I think my village is an example of how the local communities and indigenous peoples are affected with the decisions that they are not uh, done or taking their interest by the government and sometimes by the uh, um, international organization, conservationist industry and many other uh, actors. In, in my village, um, uh, we are pastoralist and uh, uh, partially farmers uh, because of the change in, in, in life and because of the of the influence of the um, I can say unsustainable uh, development in, in, in that part of the uh, of the country um, the change of how people uh, look at the tree or the forest or the natural resources from kind of um, looking at the at, at the resources, at the tree as a sacred uh, element, uh, reaching at the end to putting fire in that same tree because of 
um, the decision taken by the government, by the uh, conservation uh, organization there's, there. So my community used to appreciate and uh, each tree, each plant in the area. And this goes for hundreds of years, if, if not thousands of years. But at the end, 20 or 30 years ago, the governor decided to authorize an NGO, a rural NGO, to uh, start a, a reserve on our customary land without our consent. Um, so the, the people feel, feel that uh, we are losing our, our resources, we are losing our land. And at the end, uh, people started to put fire in the trees so that to show that they are against the, uh, the, uh, the, the conservation uh, uh, management. I, th I can say that uh, this built on the lack of really the, the, the secure um, land tenureship and the lack of understanding of the importance of the common uh, properties um, in compare to uh, the, uh, the private. So after colonization, the, uh, the, 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 um, the common land or the tribal land or customary land uh, are not recognized. It's either private or state land. So this is why people, uh, that, for example, the, 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 the government could authorize uh, an NGO to use our customary land because legally we don't own it, but customary it was our land. So the, the lack of recognition of the customary rules, customary management or governance of, of, of land and tenure is, 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 is a big issue. In, 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 in our case, we, we started with organizing uh, um, a small cooperative that's the name Dana, Kadzia Local Community Cooperative. Dana is this small village and Kadzia is the new Dana where we had to, uh, to leave Dana to the new Dana, which is Kadzia because of the, uh, of the conservation, because the afforestation and because of industry. The three, the three actors were uh, playing the same uh, a spot in our case. So, for example, afforestation, and it is really now a big problem uh, when we are talking about the climate change and we want to uh, tackle this issue, we go to uh, afforestation, planting trees, but where? This is a question. In our case, they have started this since the 50s. They think that the, because in Jordan, or in, this part, in, in our part of Jordan, it is uh, not really thick forest. Uh, it is uh, scattered trees, but um, the government at that time decided that, okay, this should be a forest. So they have planted the trees among the, uh, the, original, uh, the original trees. This makes it difficult for people to stay there because when you have um, um, all the trees, you can still graze, you can still use the area, but if you have a new planted the trees, then uh, there is a possibility for a, a, a goat or a sheep to, to attack or to eat the, the new uh, tree and you are in a danger and you have to pay like three, four uh, goats for, uh, uh, for eating one, one tree. No? So this is uh, accelerated the, uh, the um, removal or, uh, of the people from their, uh, uh, from their land and, uh, and forest. Um, the lack of, of, of understanding of the relation between um, the local community and indigenous peoples with, with, the, with the natural resources, with the trees, with the plant, with, with everything around them is an issue. Um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the lack of recognition of their role of protecting uh, uh, the, the nature, their ecosystem services, these are the causes of our problems. We need to, uh, to, understand, to, to understand what we are doing to nature and what if we were not there. Um, one of the, the examples is that if someone comes from university studying there, a young guy studying for four years at bio, biology or whatever, and he comes back to the, to the village and, um, and he started to talk about conservation. 
four years of studying is uh, he thought he thinks that it is better than the thousand years of customary or of uh, traditional knowledge on how to conserve nature and how to deal to gov to, to, to manage sustainable uh, land so uh, so this is uh, also tells about the the lack of recognition of the traditional knowledge respect of the traditional knowledge knowledge so we need to we need to uh, to understand all these issues to make sure that we as local community and indigenous peoples can act uh, as we used to positively to uh, to protect uh, to protect nature uh, to to conserve the the the, the forest and uh, because it is not kind of um, an employment opportunity for us being a, a, a local community or a indigenous people is uh, protecting nature is part of our life. It's not uh, a job we are doing. The tree is our house, the tree is our pharmacy, the tree is uh, our shade, the tree is everything. This is what my mother uh, told me. And now, because of the change, I can tell you, even my, my people, they can go to do a barbecue and they can uh, cut the whole tree to do a barbecue now. But because they have lost the, the sense of ownership to the, to the, uh, to the forest. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Khalid. And I want to, I want to pick on, the, on some of the words that you, that you shared with us, you know, that lost on sense of ownership and how the trees, the forest, is the pharmacy, the livelihood. And the tension between the formal education and uh, how often formal education looks down at traditional knowledge uh, in the day to day. Let us now move on. Thank you so much, Khalid. Let us move on now to Mari Carmen Ruiz. Mari Carmen Ruiz is a, is a PhD, is a doctor on tropical forest ecology and a master degree in restoration ecology for over 20 years. She has worked about the importance of forest in the face of climate change and she's been very actively working in the Red Plus team in Latin America. She's been working in uh, the surveillance of deforestation in, in Panama and in the region. Very happy to uh, be with you, Mari Carmen. I don't know if you can hear us. You will be speaking virtually. The floor is yours. Over yes. to you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, um, John, for your kind words. Uh, I don't know why like, my, my camera is not working, but well, doesn't matter. Um, uh, and, and also thank the, the, the GFOI and Info Forest team for giving me the opportunity to present the work I have been, if you have been doing in community-based forest monitoring for Red Plus in Latin America. Next, please. I would like to start with the approach FAO has undertaken to work with indigenous people and local communities for monitoring forests for red, as they are major stewards of the forest. We have used a bottom-up approach, where we first start by defining priorities of what to measure and monitor with traditional authorities and local communities. Then we make collaborative agreements uh, with the national and local traditional authorities, where we define the protocols for the measurements and the tools to be used for monitoring forests. Um, and if it's, it's, it's of interest of the indigenous people or local communities to include the community-based forest monitoring, the national forest monitoring system, then we also provide support for this institutionalization. One of the things we also do is foster peer-to-peer knowledge exchanges at the national and international level to reinforce knowledge among indigenous people and local communities. All this process have led to the empowerment of indigenous people and local communities in, in the tenure and governance of their forests. Uh, next, please. Uh, and this is important. Uh, we, we, this approach is, is, is given with the support also of a, a tool that FAO have developed, a, as for example, using the free 
prior and informed consent that is, is being done by the group John Lead in FAO, and, and also the voluntary guidelines of on the responsible governance of tenure for an inclusive and particip a participatory manner of the process. Next, please. The, this bottom-up approach has been applied throughout the region of Latin America, where, where capacity has been built uh, on of using tools a methodology, uh, a methodology that goes from mapping of forest and analyzing changes of forest cover uh, to terrestrial measurements for the forest resources in indigenous people territories and local communities. Next, please. Uh, and I would like to just like give a special focus of uh, um, a case study of uh, Panama. Uh, where where we use this bottom-up approach to build capacity in, in the in community-based forest monitoring with indigenous people that uh, started with a technical assistant of the UN Red program in Panama. So I just wanted also to you to, to focus on there. There's a timeline that is this is um, this is process takes a, a time and we started the finding the priorities with the Congress and Councils of Traditional Authorities of the Indigenous People in Panama, then started doing trainings of uh, for the uh, recollecting data of national for the national forest uh, inventories. So we, we we teach them the the protocols on that. Later we started trainings on um, with. Uh, GIS and remote sensing where they can they can map their their territories and then after there was other more trainings on on making better assessment or their land for example using drones uh, we're having uh, to look at early warning system for example and using geo servers to 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 manage their database and uh, information that they collect and this all through all this time, we start then doing peer-to-peer -peer exchanges at the national level within different indigenous territories, and at the international level between indigenous people and different in different countries. So this next, please. Uh, these all have been done with a learn by doing process when they indigenous people apply their knowledge to their territory. So the, what they're using their tools, they apply to the to, to their territory. And next, please. These, all this, this um, um, intervention have led to the integration of the governance process that includes internal regulation or, or the use of the resources of the forest resources in their communities. They also have uh, led to make guidelines to make complaints for the government when events of deforestation or forest degradation happen in their territory. That then will help the sustainable uh, use of forest management and the governance with equipment that have been provided to do the forest uh, community forest monitoring. And, and this has led uh, at the end to apply, uh, apply tools that not only help to monitor forests, but also help the, in their in tightening their land and in, uh, for, the, for the country to achieve the Red Plus goals. Uh, it's important, next please. It's important to say that this process cannot be have done alone, uh, that it's required um, partnership collaboration with indigenous people, local government, the government and uh, organization that have helped achieve these results. Next, please. Um, so for for con for my, my final remarks, I would like to address the importance of indigenous people and local communities exchanges where interaction with its peers reinforce knowledge provide support to, for local actions and strengthen community in practice approaches. Where the effort in the LAC region have contributed for an active network of communities strengthened and that are interested in Red Plus. Also, the strategic alliance that have been 
built through the UN Red Country Team Structure will serve as a conduit for the implementation of indigenous people and local communities and government MRB process for the implementation of the aim for forest activities. And my final message go to, to, the, so to the key role of indigenous people and local communities have in halting deforestation and forest degradation and help the preservation of ecosystem processes and local livelihoods. Next. Uh, and thank you for your attention. And I now pass the floor back to John. Thank you so much, uh, Mari Carmen. It's so nice to, and, and we need more uh, positive experiences of how to uh, survey and stop deforestation. I would like to highlight some of the important points, and I want to start by saying that the peer-to-peer -peer that you have been uh, supporting your program is fundamental. I still, the, the, the indigenous peoples in Paraguay still thank you and your team for the excellent training you gave them on how to do surveillance using drones and using uh, cell phones. And I think something very important in your program is how you combined uh, the knowledge of youth with new technologies and the knowledge of elders with the spatial mapping that they have in their minds uh, and how this blends very well, like you rightly say, within the governance systems of indigenous peoples that then work closely with the local governments to halt deforestation. Thank you so much for sharing that a beautiful experience that has worked out so well in, in Panama and in other countries. I'm going to pass now the floor to Diana Mastracci. Diana Mastracci from uh, GEO Indigenous Alliance is the co-founder and the international strategic liaison on the GEO Indigenous Alliance, the group on health observatories, which is an intergovernmental partnerships that improves the availability, access, and use of earth observation for a sustainable planet. Diana, it's a pleasure to be again with you in a panel. The floor is yours. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, would you mind sharing my slides? One minute, we are setting up your slides. Thank you. Yeah, there you are. Uh, so thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I am the international uh, liaison of the Indigenous Alliance, that is the only indigenous-led intergovernmental organization working to advocate for the access and use of Earth observation data that includes uh, images from satellites to uh, in situ weather information uh, to climate data by and for indigenous people. Uh, our mission is to ensure that indigenous people's voices and knowledge are heard and incorporated in the development of Earth observation technologies and to co-design solutions with and for indigenous people that take into consideration communities' cultural protocols and cutting edge Earth observation data. Uh, next slide, please. So the Geo Indigenous Alliance was launched in 2019 during the Geo Ministerial in Canberra, Australia, by indigenous leaders from around the world. Our work, um, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Our work is focused on four main themes, uh, women and youth empowerment, climate action, food security, disaster risk resilience, and indigenous data sovereignty. These themes were selected by the indigenous leadership of the Alliance based on consultations uh, with indigenous elders and knowledge holders from around the world. They were also the focus of the Geo-Indigenous Geo Summit that was held in 2020, which brought together over 1,000 indigenous people, elders, data providers, UN officials, um, to discuss the challenges and opportunities of Earth observation data and tools uh, for and by indigenous uh, communities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our strategic pathways uh, highlight the importance of engaging with indigenous people in all aspects of Earth observation data production, dissemination, and use for climate action. It also emphasizes the need to build indigenous people and local communities' capacity to access and use Earth observation data for their own needs. So our first strategic pathway is to use Earth observation data to enhance intergenerational knowledge transfer from the elders to the youth. Through our work, we are bridging the gap between traditional knowledge and modern science, creating a platform for the exchange of ideas and ensuring that the knowledge that the elders 
and esteemed knowledge holders have is preserved and passed on. Our second pathway is to develop and enrich, enrich strategic path partnerships with the GEO community. We are building alliances with organizations and individuals who share our vision of a world where indigenous people are full partners in the access and use of Earth observation data and tools. Our third pathway is to prepare the next uh, GEO indigenous workforce for the future. We are developing training materials on indigenous engagement and convening an advisory group of indigenous representatives, as well as providing guidelines on how to engage with indigenous communities. Our fourth uh, pathway is to conserve and steward indigenous cultural knowledge. We're committed to protecting indigenous cultural heritage and ensuring that indigenous tradition and values are respected. And our fifth and uh, final pathway is to provide guidelines on how to engage with indigenous communities. We want to ensure that indigenous people and local communities are fully involved in the decision-making process. And this is our current strategy. Uh, we are currently developing uh, training materials on indigenous engagement, convening an advisory group on, of indigenous representatives, and developing the Indigenous Alliance principles of engagement, um, as well as developing an indigenous impact assessment. Uh, these um, initiatives are designed to promote respectful and meaningful engagement with indigenous people and local communities in the development and use of earth observation tools, which has been one of our main challenges. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Geo-Indigenous Alliance has, uh, also uses a unique method to co-design software with and for indigenous people that we call the Indigenous Hackathon Methodology, which takes into account the needs and priorities of indigenous people and has been instrumental in developing our pilot projects. Um, a successful example is the Namunyak app which was a challenge submitted by uh, Taita Suletapu from the Samburu tribe, who is also one of the co-founders of the alliance. Um, he's from the Samburu tribe in Kenya. And the, um, the, the app is named after the Samburu word uh, for a blessing, Namuniak. And uh, it aims to empower the community to map their own land uh, using local symbols instead of geographic coordinates, providing a local record of climate change and aiding adaptation to extreme weather events as their communities have been facing severe droughts and which has really been affecting their nomadic livelihoods. Uh, this app is um, improving the communication uh, between uh, neighboring tribes, allowing people to report their location to the government and fa is facilitating uh, better communication uh, among community members and park rangers. Um, Additionally, it will help manage and uh, resources sustainably, reducing conflict over uh, resources such, such as water and pasture. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Shakain project in the Amazon rainforest, uh, led by uh, Mario Vargas Shakain, is another inspiring example. Uh, Mario Vargas is from the uh, Shuar um, Nation in the Ecuadorian Amazon. And this indigenous-led reforestation project is using satellite data to calculate the carbon stored in newly reforested lands, while also working to restore traditional food systems that have been disrupted by climate change and deforestation. Uh, through the Nanti app, which uh, was the challenge submitted by Mario Vargas, um, anyone anywhere would be able to participate in reforestation efforts and support the Shuar people in their efforts to restore their lands. The impact of this app cannot be understated as the Amazon rainforest plays a critical role in global climate regulation and it's home to countless indigenous communities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also recognize that capacity building is a long-term process that requires sustained engagement and investment. Our strategic pathways includes a commitment to building a global network of indigenous people who can support each other in accessing and using Earth observation data. Uh, we believe that this network can serve as a platform for sharing knowledge experiences and best practices and for advocating for the integration of indigenous knowledge in the in earth observation data policies. Uh, this is an example of one of our upcoming activities, uh, the Indigenous uh, Roundtable in partnership with Norway's International Climate and Forest Initiative, uh, NICFI, Satellite Data Program. 
Uh, this event will bring together global leaders and stakeholders to explore indigenous-led innovation in earth observation and identify solutions through data and capacity building. It will be held in both Spanish and English, and we encourage you to, um, to join us. Uh, you can find the registration on our Twitter account, at GIAindigenous. And also some of our partners from NICFI are there uh, on site at FAO, so please, uh, if you have a chance, uh, talk to them directly. Uh, we also uh, have an ongoing survey on the um, access and use of satellite data by indigenous people for uh, forest conservation that you will find in the registration platform. Diana, and, I'm, going um, to, I'm going to kindly ask yeah, you next to slide. wrap up, please. Yeah. And so uh, these are some of our recent publications uh, um, that you can find on our website. Next slide. And to conclude, uh, we're committed to empowering indigenous people and local communities and accessing Earth observation data. And um, please get in touch with me if you would like to know more. Uh, these are our, that's my email and uh, Twitter handles. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Diana. We have taken notes of the Namuyak app, as well as the events on the 7th and the 8th on how to combine uh, geospatial data with technologies uh, to advance indigenous people's rights. Uh, we, I, I want to give time for the questions and answers. Uh, we are slightly behind schedule, but I think it's important to, to have your questions and answers. We are going to be taking questions from the floor as well as from the people that are connected online. But before then, let me pass the floor to two very important guests that we have with us. The first one is Nahid uh, Nagizadeh uh, from CENESTA, the Center for Sustainable Development and Environment. Nahid is a senior expert and research associate and has worked in CENESTA since 1994. She has been doing a number of very important activities on indigenous, endogenous development and self-organization of indigenous peoples. And she's recently working on the dry net network. Uh, she's currently working on land governance assessments in customary territory of indigenous mobile pastoralists. Nahid, uh, can you hear us? And I want to thank you. I know it's a very special day uh, for you today. And I want to thank you for finding time for us. The floor is yours. Uh, for the next five minutes. Over to you, Nahid. Thank you, Jan. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Go ahead. Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks to all organizers of the event for giving this valuable opportunity. Uh, I am from Senesta, a civil society organization from Iran, as you know, Senesta works with diverse groups of dryland communities, mobile pastoralists, forest dwellers, marine and coastal communities, and small-scale farmers. And Senesta dedicated to promoting sustainable community and cultural-based development with indigenous, indigenous peoples and local communities of Iran. In general, at global level, we think despite the unique role of indigenous peoples, and local communities in conserving nature, uh, sustaining local and national economics, and uh, fostering food sovereignty, indigenous peoples and local communities remain relatively marginalized and suffer under a variety of oppressive policies and reforms. These top-down policies have weakened the customary institutions and means of self-sustenance of indigenous peoples and local uh, communities. For instance, Asia is home to almost 70% of total indigenous peoples of the world and to the highest percentage of people living in rural areas and in unvulnerable circumstances. But only three countries out of, 80, out of 48 countries legally recognized indigenous peoples in this region. Therefore, we as Senesta has been working on re-empowering communities, indigenous peoples, and supporting them through a self-strengthening process for over 30 years. The aim is their capacity to take their destiny into their hands uh, uh, via self-governance and or shared governance situation. Today, uh, I would like to emphasize the importance of recognizing the territories of life in all types of ecosystems, including forests, because they are very important territories of life known as ICCA that 
ICCS that concerned by indigenous peoples and local communities. And as we know, has been recognized by uh, CBD and IUCN since 2008. And they are as diverse as the peoples and communities who shape and sustain them through their unique cultures, governance systems, and practices. They are also estimated to cover at least 50% of the world's land under customary systems and hold a large portion of the world's endangered animals and plant species. Territories of life also store more than one-eighth of all the carbon in the world's tropical forests and have lower rates of deforestation than state-protected areas. However, territories, areas, uh, uh, territories of life often face overlapping political and economic interests, seeking to either protect nature or exploit nature within their lands and territories, and indigenous peoples and local communities face growing threats from harmful industries and violence for defending themselves against such industries. As we know, according to the Intergovernmental Panel uh, on Climate Change, human-induced climate change is causing dangerous and widespread expression in nature and affecting the lives of billions of people around the world. Therefore, one of the key solutions to address the biodiversity at climate crisis is to support indigenous peoples and local communities to secure their rights to self-determined governance systems within their territories of life. They are custodians of their territories and areas, and we call the use of participatory and inclusive approaches, methods, and tools for forest and land monitoring policies and programs to respect the knowledge, values, and perspectives of those communities. Also, we call for stronger advocacy and modification of the relevant policies and programs for the inclusion and recognition of the ICCs or territories of life at national and international policies and frameworks related to forests and other uh, land monitoring mechanisms, such as Red Plus, NDCs, and MSFs, and necessity to establish various mechanisms to recognize the rights and roles in conservation and provide them with adequate recognition and support. Uh, that's all. Thank you for your uh, time and attention. Nahid, thank you so much. Let us give a round. And I want to I want to pick on a couple of ideas that the need to recognize uh, indigenous peoples to protect forests and as you rightly say other ecosystems, and the fact that the large majority of indigenous peoples live in Asia and very often are not recognized. How are we going to protect the forests where they live if indigenous peoples are not uh, recognized? How are we going to secure the rights? How are we going to ensure that? Uh, the industries and extractive uh, activities do not impact them negatively. Thank you so much for your words. Thank you for being with us today, particularly today. I'm going to straight away pass the floor to Gam Sindrai. Gam is the Secretary General of the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact. Uh, this is the largest uh, network organization of indigenous peoples in Asia. Gam Sindrai is a Naga, and he's a devoted human rights activist for more than 30 years. And right now, he's the Secretary General of AIPP. Uh, he has very good knowledge on issues on biodiversity, indigenous knowledge, and self-determination. Uh, over to you, Gam. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, Jan, for giving me this opportunity to address some of the issues uh, from Asia. But I must say that the previous panels have covered most of the important issues, including some of the important data that needs to be known by the global community. Uh, but uh, so let me just flag a few important points, which uh, I think are important. One is I think in the first place, this initiative is important and must be acknowledged. Uh, in the context of the global agenda on sustainable development, biodiversity and climate change, where all these agenda have proclaimed to, to adopt or apply the human rights based approach and also respect indigenous people's rights and that of local communities. I think these are very significant uh, for us as the bearers of these fundamental, fundamental rights and freedom. And not just as rights, 
but also because we as indigenous peoples and local communities, we have this special spiritual connection to our lands and territories. And this presents a worldview and also a culture that is uh, potentially part of the solution to some of the crises that we are facing with reference to sustainable development, biodiversity and climate change. And as we have always pointed out, of course, this human rights based approach is a milestone for us in the, in the history of the UN at the moment, because these rights to our territor territories and lands are also part of the solution. So this spirituality aspect and this rights back aspect to our lands and territories are inseparable. Rather, the spiritual connection and the cultural uh, um, <clears throat> practices that uphold sustainability, biodiversity, and uh, part of the solution to climate change is part of the reasoning why these rights are important for uh, for the uh, for not just for indigenous peoples and local communities for the but for the global society as well. Now, the important few points that I wanted to point out is that with reference to the human rights-based approach, what does it mean? As some of the panels also have presented, it, in, it invariably means that indigenous leadership must be very clearly emphasized as we um, apply this kind of innovative approaches to monitoring of forests and land. And this also means, therefore, that indigenous or and customer institutions must be uh, recognized because these customer institution, institutions are the one that regulates and, and also governs the uh, uh, lands and territories uh, and management of resources um, in our context. Now, this also means, therefore, that indigenous and communities initiative must be prioritized uh, uh, in all these initiatives and the resources that are promised must prioritize these communities initiatives. You know? um, so therefore, there are good developments and this is what I'm acknowledging. But at the same time, the irony and challenge is something that we must also keep in mind. You know? That is that, OK, all these Pledges are being made in terms of financial resources, which is important and good. But at the same time, the militarization and displacement and the attacks on the human rights defenders and indigenous human rights defenders in particular, these are, uh, are the fundament, fundamental challenges because these two things cannot go together. On one hand, this kind of ev eviction and violation of rights at a very intense level. And on the other side, the expectation to be delivering and contributing as a solution to these problems of sustainability, biodiversity and, and climate change. So therefore, if we have to see this change, that means that human rights based approach must be seen as recognizing our rights. It also means deepening, uh, deepening of commitment and action uh, for sustainability, biodiversity uh, conservation, and climate change. And I think the third and most important part is also that we must democratize our institutions and the way we do things and bring up and emphasize people's uh, uh, governance. No? So finally, my final point is that what this means at the domestic level is that we must shift uh, away from framing of laws and policies uh, and programs from a distance, what has been the practice at the moment, right? From For people that where the law experts and policymakers hardly know of the lands and territories and the resources and of the culture and the people itself, you know? These are the kind of ways that we have approached and this will not bring about any kind of success. Uh, so which that what this means is that therefore indigenous peoples uh, we must close the gap by bringing indigenous peoples and local communities at the heart of governance decision making programming and and implementation at the domestic level so that these global commitment uh, and pledges that has been made can be realized in its uh, uh, in its truest sense you no know? 
So yeah, I will stop there. Thank you, uh, Jan. Thank you so much, Jan. Let us give you a round. I think you have touched upon many important points. Uh, uh, first of all, the importance of this initiative within the Sustainable Development Agenda, but at the same time, the connection between the spirituality uh, for indigenous peoples to land or the forest, and how this is part of the solution at the global level, not only for indigenous peoples. I think you highlight the contradiction that on the one hand, we want to protect forests and we want to reinforce indigenous people's rights over those forests as a way to combat climate change. But at the same time, indigenous peoples are being displaced, are being, uh, are being militarized, and sometimes they are being killed. And I want to highlight the fact that during the COVID pandemic, um, it, it was extremely shocking to see that the number of killings and violence against indigenous peoples went up instead of going down. So that gives us a bad indication on things that we need to sort out, that probably are the contradictions that we all hold within ourselves. Uh, we, have, we are slightly behind. We have five minutes. Uh, but I would like to ask uh, the, the interpreters if they can support us with five additional minutes. I would like to take some questions and answers from the floor. Uh, we have a question that has come online uh, that we are going to be asking uh, uh, to uh, the Aim for Forest probably to work. But please raise your hand. If you would like to ask any question, um, introduce yourself and ask the question to one of our panelists, please. The floor is open. Please. Hi, um, thanks so much for the panelists. It was a really nice discussion. My name is Daniela, and I am a researcher at Wageningen University. Um, so, uh, there was some discussion about um, basically how uh, sometimes indigenous knowledge or indigenous science is really opposed with uh, ecologi traditional ecological science and, um, and basically remote sensing as well. So I wanted to see, maybe get your opinions on, as an R&D, as a research community, what, what advice would you give us to better communicate? Like, I, I see that there is need for more humility from the research side, but I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks. Thank you, Daniela from Bacheningen. Will you, who would you like to address that question? Should we pass yes. it to Guy, for example? Yes, uh, I was thinking, yes, of Guy, but also of Khalid. Guy and Khalid. Can, can I ask you one minute each to respond? One minute, will you please? Will respond? Ok, merci beaucoup Daniela pour la question. Euh, je pense que la question est tellement fondamentale. Et sur cette question, euh, pour le moment, les peuples autochtones sont en train de mener et comment valoriser leur culture traditionnelle pour qu'ils soient aussi considérés comme euh, une des solutions meilleures. Et c'est pour cette raison que ce que vous voyez... Euh, Le plus grand nombre de gens considèrent les, les connaissances des peuples autochtones comme une euh, manière empirique. Et auparavant, ce n'était pas euh, d'une manière qui a négligé, puisque eux, ils considéraient ça comme un moyen et une solution pour la conservation et pour leur survie. Alors, pour le moment, ce que nous faisons et nous lutons, Comment matérialiser, comment valoriser le culture, qu'il soit à la portée de tous et qu'il porte un de plus sur l'amélioration des conditions de vie. Et voilà, en aimant, c'est un peu ça que je peux expliquer par rapport aux connaissances des peuples autochtones, comment ils veulent la moderniser, moderniser leur tradition, à être à la portée de tout le monde. Je ne sais pas si vous êtes satisfait à la question. Merci, uh, Guy. Uh, let us pass the floor also to Khalid. 
Uh, thank you so much, Anil. Uh, I think one of the, of the points, I thought that there would be another round for us to talk about. One of the most important uh, points that we are uh, looking for is to have a connection with uh, universities, with research institutions, because we need to have our... Um, we think that you researchers are the interpreter of the uh, traditional knowledge to to the other uh, to the other parties we uh, think that um, your role is important we need we need you we need to have uh, Good understand because it's easier for you to to to, to visit the, the the local communities and indigenous peoples to uh, to talk to them to understand what is uh, their their role, uh, what is their uh, the, the knowledge that they have, uh, and to transfer that into a language that is suitable for other uh, for the policymakers who trust you more than than us who understand you more than us. So it is important to. Uh, to transfer the message through the researchers. This is, I am, again, I wanted to ask for um, connecting the universities, either locally or internationally with, uh, with, uh, with indigenous people and uh, local communities, uh, giving opportunities for uh, um, indigenous peoples and local communities, youth, to, uh, to participate or to engage in, 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 in majors that is related to their uh, livelihoods, not to uh, majors that bringing them away or to kick them away from their uh, uh, livelihoods, uh, giving opportunities for the for the for the uh, youth to uh, for the universities, um, encouraging local universities or um, national universities to 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 work with with the with the, with the um, indigenous peoples and local communities uh, um, because it is important that. Uh, we um, bridge the bridge the gap of of, of knowledge of understanding, and uh, this is also related to the issue of uh, if we want to reach the to the indigenous peoples and local communities, we need to find the proper ways and means and language to reach them. And and and, and of course, uh, you cannot use only internet. You cannot use only mobile phones on all these measures. You can find, you need to find the proper proper uh, proper ways. And of course, uh, languages. Uh, I think most of the indigenous people they are not using English, French, and uh, uh, Spanish. Eh? So uh, we need um, not only the, these languages. Even if you speak Arabic with uh, with uh, with the communities, you need to have a proper. A level of Arabic that suits the, the community, or English that suits, or the Spanish. In, uh, in this case, so um, the means and ways and the, the proper language uh, for the to communicate with the communities, to understand them, and to understand their situation. It is not um, a scientific community that you are approaching. It is a community that uh, doesn't say things directly. So you need to find a way to how to get the, the, the knowledge from them. Sorry, for take more time. Shukran, Khalid. Thank you so much. Um, I know that Ward and uh, Mari Carmen also want to chip in on this one, but I want to take this opportunity, Ward, to ask you a question that arrives through the uh, WhatsApp, uh, through the chat, which is countries engage in community-based approaches uh, in forest and land. How can they benefit from aim for forest? I wonder if you can take this one and as well as the one from Daniel in Bacheningen. But one minute, please. We want to give the chance also to, uh, to our colleague, Marie. I'll be very short. Just on this question, it's not only about communication and making them users of your data. It's making them part of your project. In the aims for forests and in Landmark particularly, it's not one indigenous people that is represented. It's 50% of the people engaged in the program in Landmark are indigenous peoples and local communities. They guide us in what Landmark should do. And I will, the responsible for Aims of Force is here, and I'm looking at him, I will make sure that certain of these indigenous peoples and local communities will have a representation in Aims of Forest as well, so that <coughs> they can guide, they can present their contacts and their questions, and, and just contribute. There's a lot of local knowledge that is valuable for, for these projects as well. On the second question, yes, um, as I said in my presentation, the first step of AIMS for Forest Work Package 3 is to do a, an in-depth mapping of what's going on, what the capacities are, and what the needs are. We will do this already through the regional platforms and the regional community of practice that we want to establish, so it will be led by indigenous peoples and local communities. 
and, and I think, I hope, that the projects you're talking about in, 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 the, in the chat here will be um, part of this inventory and then can contribute to, to, yeah, to, the, to the whole debate on how should we structure and on what capacities that have been ongoing already should we base uh, AIMS for 4 and this work package 3. So absolutely, um, I note the activities in Mexico here that are detailed uh, and we will certainly include you uh, in the process of mapping them and hopefully further down the road when we implement AIMS for 4, for forest. Thank you so much, Ward. Eh, Mari Carmen, creo que, que quería comentar también la, la pregunta de Daniela. Eh, un minuto, por favor. Thanks, John. Yes, I was wanting to complement that. I, I, we have the experience that we have had um, in in Latin America. I mean, the the indigenous uh, technicians, the, the 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 youth, they are like keen to to use the different methodology, um, different. Te um, technical tools and also if they because it's be we construct this from the beginning based on their priorities they, they they see how these tools really help for them to attain uh, things that are are or their interest for example having a like land tenure rights or protecting the forest so so they so i just wanted to say that it's not they're just complementary activities. It's just the way that you construct it together. That, that is the most important thing. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Mari Carmen. I don't know if there is any last quick comment or question from the audience. Otherwise, let me try to wrap up also being conscious of the, of the interpreter's time and their, their generosity. So I think it's been an extremely interesting session where uh, we have seen how relevant is what we have at the stake. The fact that uh, there is 70% uh, of the world forest uh, land that is managed uh, by indigenous peoples and only 15% of it is documented. Or 50% of the land that is occupied by indigenous peoples and only 10% are uh, documented. And this occupies 70% of the world's forest. So in a way, we cannot uh, protect forest if we don't put indigenous peoples at the center of the discussions, like many of the speakers had mentioned. But at the same time, the need to link data building with decision making and to uh, go beyond the current, uh, the current arrogance that formal education uh, is having vis-a-vis -vis oral knowledge and traditional knowledge. How do we integrate orality spoken by th millions of people across the world into forms of evidence that can influence effective decision making? And how can we do that with respect to indigenous peoples when we know that only 7% of the funds already disbursed uh, from the Glasgow Pledge have actually reached indigenous peoples. Where is the rest of the 93% remaining funding that has been disbursed? An opportunity in Aim for Forest, an opportunity with the initiatives that are being uh, uh, shared here today, but probably integration and coordination is the key word. It seems like we are all working in parallel tracks. We cannot have uh, forests protected if we don't have healthy indigenous peoples' food systems and we cannot have healthy indigenous people's food systems without secure tenure rights and without healthy forests. How do we ensure that the connection between indigenous people's food and knowledge systems and biodiversity conservation is guaranteed? And how do we ensure that we move beyond data and tools, geospatial tools, uh, drones, uh, cell phones, uh, tablets, applications? How do we ensure that all of that is coordinated in a way that stops the violence against indigenous peoples and the criminalization that indigenous peoples have for defending their lands, territories, and natural resources? How do we ensure that we put free, prior, and informed consent at the center of the decision making? And how do we ensure that the existing tools, whether it is the voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure of land, whether it is the right to food guidelines, are respected and implemented at the different levels? I think the, the aim for forest uh, offers an opportunity working in Africa, Asia, uh, Iberoamerica, the Pacific, with more than 20 countries. How do we ensure that uh, this moves from a project to a way of doing policy making that uh, see pages other countries and other realities? And how do we ensure that 
uh, working with local communities does not put in the back burner the rights of indigenous peoples across the world. Recently, uh, in the UN Permanent Forum, for the second time, the UN Permanent Forum and indigenous leaders have asked the UN system to stop using the acronym indigenous peoples and local communities in one single sentence, because this is seen as uh, a way of moving backwards the rights of indigenous peoples after years of a struggle to have them enshrined in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. How can we ensure that in the very important work that you're doing with forests, we respect this call by indigenous leaders to not uh, jeopardize the rights and to ensure that, uh, like Khalid was saying, uh, indigenous peoples' lands and forests are not given in concessions by the governments for other uses. It's been an in extremely interesting discussion with so much uh, take-home messages. I would like to thank all the speakers. I would like to thank the organizers. And I think it's a very promising opportunity for all of us to work together and establish a clear connection between indigenous peoples, food systems, forests, tenure issues, and governance issues. Thank you so very much for being here. And let us give a big round to all the speakers. And thank you to the interpreters. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. That was, that was really remarkable. I think this is just the start of a discussion. So please, if we move to the atrium, we can keep this, uh, this discussion alive. Thank you very much.